animals just to get a glimpse of what was not even God's presence. But now we dwell in the secret place of the Most High. We abide under that shadow. So sometimes we just want to bask in God's love for us and enjoy His presence. The Bible says it, Philippians 3 verse 1, put it up in TPT. Do not ever limit your joy to your experiences or to events in your life. But enjoy the wonderful experience of knowing Jesus. Don't ever limit your joy or fail to rejoice in a wonderful experience. It satisfies like nothing else. It brings joy like nothing else. It makes life make meaning like nothing else. It brings peace in the storm. And I just want you to remember his love this morning and bless him before we go into the word. To be seeing how I remember. I remember all you've done for me. Remember the beginning of this year. Remember the cross. Remember him stuck I naked. Remember where he brought me from. Remember his love. I'm forever grateful for your love. Yahweh. You deserve my praise. Do it intentionally just for one, two minutes this morning. I remember all you've done for me. I remember where you brought From one me. judgment hall to another. Nailed eagle spread on the Roman cross. I'm forever gr grateful for Wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. Yahweh. Greater love has no one than this, than if you lay down his life for his friends. And you deserve my praise.
very easy to become so comfortable with some of the blessings and the mercies of God that we enjoy every day of our lives. But if you are glad that you have eternal life, if you are glad that you don't have, you know, religion, Christ is in you. All of God is in you. You have a future. You have a hope. We are not hopeless in this world. We have hope in God. Our future is secure. Because he lives, we live. Because he lives, we can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Self. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, you look good today. You look good today. You are looking very sweet. You look good. It's okay to look good. Right? It's the beauty of holiness. Beauty. There's no ugliness in holiness. Hallelujah. God himself is beautiful. So we are beautiful as well. Amen. Are you ready to go into the Word of God this morning? I have to. I'm going to build and build. So, um, knowledge is very important. You are a product of the knowledge you are exposed to. Your ignorance, they say, well, they say knowledge is expensive. Try out ignorance. You'll pay more. For your ignorance. So if you decide to ignore knowledge, they say even in generally, you know, when motivational speakers or people speak about the fact that you either suffer the pain of discipline or the pain of regret, you have to choose one. So once you become born again, the Bible says, earnestly desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow. The next most important thing in your life that you have become born again is to grow in what you have received. And growth is not a gift. They can't lay hands on you to grow. They can't anoint you to grow. If you if you continue in my word, John 8, 31, then are ye my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. So there has to be the decision for growth. And just like I always tell my people here, we always say this, never get tired. You see how when you want to eat your best meal, whether some of you is fried rice and plantain. I don't know. There are various delicacies that we all like. There is an expectation of your heart that comes to play when you are expecting to eat the best meal or you are going for a buffet. You are about to have some good buffet that will enrich you for life. Right? The Bible says, the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any twist word. He says, my son, attend to my words. Incline your ears to my sin. Let them not depart from thy mouth. Keep them in the midst of thy heart, for they are alive. They enrich you. They empower you. They make Christianity fruitful. They make Christianity impactful. More than any other thing, miracles will not grow the believer. 
Anointing will grow the believer, but the word will grow the believer. And that's what you need. But wait. What is the word? Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We just mentioned one thing. First of all, we said that we should desire the sincere. So if there is a sincere milk, there could be an, a milk that is not sincere. So it's not any word that will grow the believer. It's the sincere one. And the Bible says that study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not rightly. So you can wrongly divide the word of truth. See, today we are going to attempt, I realize that the best way sometimes to preach, especially with this message we preach, is to answer some of the questions that I know are probably in the minds of people, right? The message we preach at Cross Point is the message of grace. Now, unfortunately, that message may be a little bit strange, and it's fine, because that's not what is in the mainstream. But at different times and seasons, revelation is progressive sometimes. These things happen. But what is happening is that it will be strange to your ears. And you may be getting confused. So I will try my best to begin to answer some of the questions as we are preaching. Amen. Is that fine? Okay, let's open to 2 Timothy 3.15. 2 Timothy 3.15. 2 Timothy 3.15. But before we open there, let me say some few words while it's there. For the gospel to be preached correctly, the Bible must be interpreted properly. For the gospel to be preached correctly, the Bible must be interpreted properly. We can only preach the gospel when the Bible is interpreted rightly. Listen to this. Now, remember, the gospel is the power of God, not anointing oil. Help us with your phone. We know they are busy and they like to call you. The gospel is the power. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God. Fasting doesn't give you power. The Holy Spirit is not even the power. Mm, Pastor, don't go there. I'll go. (laughs) The Holy Spirit work is to reveal Christ. Christ is the power. So you can follow you like. If you have not seen Jesus, you have not seen the power of God. The work of the Holy Spirit is to reveal Christ to you, the gospel. Are you hearing? You, you are not. You know, you want to stay with what you have heard. You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. He didn't say the Holy Spirit is the power. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, it will open you up to light. That light is what brings power to your life. So whatever gymnastic you may have, I'm sorry to say gymnastic, whatever manifestation, it's okay to manifest. But what revelation has hit your heart? That's the power in your life. If you jump, no problem. What revelation has hit your heart as he was teaching in a certain place? The power was present to heal them. So, in the gospel is the power. Christ is the message of the grace, which is also the power. Because what we want to find out here or solve is, Ultimately, there are two things in people's mind concerning the message of grace. 
And the message of grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. The message of grace is the message of the New Testament. The message of grace says that once you are saved, you are saved forever. Now, there are two issues that come to mind of an average Christian. The first one is, if you preach this message that God just loves us like that, you should just know that God loves us. Every time God loves us, God loves us. Won't people sin? And, and it's, it's genuine. Because people genuinely are asking that question. So let's, let's try and solve it. Let's not fight and say, no, it doesn't. Why? I understand you. Every time you are talking about God's love, God's love, you know, there is sin in town. What are we going to do about it? How can you just be talking? You know, I know some people have asked your pastor, is he looking down on sin? See that he doesn't preach it. Okay. The other one, to his power, result. All this God's love, God's love, how will it change my life? No, I'm trying to be practical here. All these things, because how will this love that you are preaching, sir, help me and my problems? So can we go on this journey? Now, I first of all have to show you that the power you are looking for is in a message. So, let me show you. Acts 20, 32, TPT. You know, I, 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 I always like to put this caveat. I'm not that old, but in the journey of life, I've entered different seasons. I've had problems. Still have problems. You know, problem is not, as they say, problem doesn't really finish. Probably have problems. It's just how you approach the problems and how you use wisdom, the problem. But I've, I've been in the faith for quite a while. I've done all the things that I believe most of us have done. Maybe you have done more than me, Seth, who knows? But I prayed, done all the fasting kind of fast, done all the sacrifice kind of sacrifice that you may think. But there is something about my life that changed when I encountered God's grace. So when you are talking about results, you know, there, are, there are certain things that we call results in the body of Christ that we need to change. Because Babalao self has that result. If it's just you buy fine house. I'm not saying fine house is not good. But you just look at somebody, he has fine house. Well, I'm robbers and drug dealers have fine house. So we can't just say fine house. That means we have to see results, the power of God, in the light of what the scripture says the power and results is. Are we there? Okay, let's see. In Acts 20, 32, I'll break some things down. It's two sections. And so, and so now, I entrust you into God's hand. See, this is the Bible saying something. Who wants to be in God's hand? Is that not the best place you can ever be? If they say, be in Pastor Ladi's hand or be in God's hand, won't you choose God? If they say, be in, I don't know, who is the strongest man on earth, be in his hand or be in God's hand, you will choose God's hand. The, the best place one can be. Not being that the Geo's hand. There's nothing wrong with it. I'm, I mean, I'm not that the Geo can be pastor anybody. God's hand. To be in God's hand, I entrust you into God's hands and the message of his grace. That and there is the Kai rule of Bible interpretation. It means which is or that is. It's not I entrust you into God's hand, one, and the message of his grace, two. So you are in God's hand and the message of grace. No. The message of God's grace is God's hand. So, Hearing the message of his grace is being in God's hand. Which other place is better for the believer? Which other anointing, which other mantle can be better than the message of his grace, which is God's hand? And that God's hand here is figurative. 
It's not like God will come and carry you, but he's saying that you are taking care and God is taking care of you. The message of his grace will see the manifestation of God's hand, which is God's goodness in your life. Now, I entrust you into God's hand. The best thing a pastor can do is to entrust the people into God's hands. And the best the way he can do that is by teaching the message of grace, not the message of rules and regulations. Because you would think you are entrusting those people into God's hands by telling them every time all these things they need to not commit and the ones they have committed knowingly and unknowingly. You are not entrusting them into God's hand. According to the scripture, according to human psychology, we think that that's entrusting people into God's hand. But God is saying to entrust people into the hand of God is to preach the message of Moses. The message of the laws that you need to keep. The message of grace. Which is all that you need to become strong. You see, many of the things that you are calling problem is lack of strength and staying power. When you have the ruggedness of Christ, you will surmount challenges easily. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them for greater. It takes tenacity to push through life. And that strength is in Christ. They grow from strength. Everyone that appeared before that and is in the message of his grace. Not the, me- the message of rules and regulation will take the small strength you have. It's, he said it's all you need. It's not, you don't need anointing to top it. It's all you, are you, it's not me saying now. It's all you need to become strong. All again comes again. All of God's blessings are imparted. That word imparted is important. They are not worked for. They are not attained. They are imparted. Gifted, that's what it means, through the message of his grace, which he provides as a spiritual inheritance given to all of his holy ones. See the words that the Bible uses for us, holy ones, that you say I'm not holy. Who now, who is right, God or you? Let every man be a liar and let God be true. All of God's blessings are imparted through a message. So let's find out what this message is. 2 Timothy 3.15. And that from a child you have known the Holy Scriptures. Paul is telling Timothy, which is able to make thee wise. That word known, put it up, you have become familiar. So Paul is telling Timothy, you have been familiar with the Scriptures. Now, question. Timothy, when Paul is telling Timothy, was Timothy written? Don't, in the front, don't show your spiritual muscle. Was Timothy written? Can be written now because he's still talking. So, what is the scriptures that Timothy was familiar with? The Old Testament. So, Paul is telling Timothy, where since you have been a child, you have become, you have known. That known is the word oida. You have become acquainted or familiar with the Old Testament. What is Old Testament, friends? Genesis to, right? Okay? Genesis to Malachi. That's Old Testament. Just basic stuff. Let's not go deep. Genesis to Malachi. Yeah. Right? So, so that is what Timothy was acquainted with. As from a child, you have known and become familiar with the Holy Scriptures. It's able to make thee wise unto salvation. That word wise is, making to, is able to make you skillful or is able to make you skillful in the subject matter of salvation. 
How is the Old Testament supposed to make you wise in the subject matter of salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus? I thought the Old Testament is filled with Moses' law. How come now Paul is telling Timothy that the Old Testament is supposed to make you wise? It's from the Greek word sophizo. Skillful in salvation through keeping the law of Moses. No, through faith in Christ. That means the Old Testament has an agenda. Not the one that maybe you have taught all the while. Because if you see the Old Testament bare like that, what the Old Testament was showing us was not faith in Christ Jesus. Am I speaking? The Old Testament was showing us fire. You pick um, sticks to cook on Sabbath day, they kill you. That's what the Old Testament... So where did faith in Christ Jesus come here? Paul is telling... It's New Testament. Paul is telling... It's not able to make you wise unto the Elijah anointings. It's able to make the wise, skillful, useful in the subject matter of salvation. And salvation is not in keeping rules. Salvation, true faith in a person. So, the subject matter of the Old Testament is salvation, true faith in Christ. So, the agenda, the bias, the intent of the scripture is to make you wise in the knowledge of Christ. Next verse. Next verse. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God. The word all scripture or scripture is the Herios grammar, means the set apart writings. So the scriptures are set apart. Set apart to reveal a subject matter primarily. So for those who read Ababio, Ababio is set apart to understand chemistry, science students. General mathematics is set apart to understand exactly. The Bible is set apart to understand Christ. That's the primary aim of the Bible, to see Christ. And in seeing Christ, you will see you. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable, of Philemon, is advantageous. Now, the scripture is advantageous for something. The Bible is now showing you how the scriptures is profitable. The scripture is profitable for one, doctrine. What is doctrine? Doctrine is not time scarf or not time scarf. Doctrine is not trouser or skirt. Doctrine is not cap or no cap when you want to pray. I'm just, I'm not, if you have those things in your mind, well, that's another teaching. But what we are saying there, that word doctrine is from the original word, didaskelia, it means teaching or explanation. Are you with me? The Bible can never profit you until it's explained. Regurgitating or cramming the Bible is of no benefit without understanding. Some people, you know, we always say, some people, they will quote plenty of scriptures when they are trying to argue with us on Instagram and post it, and they will feel like a champion. But read it and understand it first. It's just like how you used to chew and pour. Not you, maybe me. In university, you know what chew and pour is. You cram and you are going for that exam. You don't talk to anybody because if somebody say hello, one thing can fall out of. You have to keep it in check so that you can pour it for them and leave them in the school and got your certificate. So it's not about cramming or regurgitating it. And quoting a lot of it. There's nothing wrong in having memory verse, but understand the verse you are memorizing. 
So, is to be, the Bible is to be explained. When the Bible is not explained and you just cram it, there is understanding deficiency, which leads to wrong application. A wrong interpretation of the scripture will lead to a wrong application of the scripture. That's why we said any time a Bible passage is misinterpreted, a truth is lost. Now, so when he said doctrine there, Acts 2.42 says, they continued in the apostles' doctrine. If you look at it in NLT or NIV, it's the apostles' teaching. So, teaching and explanation. So, it's profitable when the Bible is profitable when it is taught, explained. So, if you are somebody that doesn't like people to explain something to you, it will be difficult. Because a lazy approach to Bible study will lead to manipulation. Once you have a lazy approach, you just want to pick one and use it for testimony. You will be easily man. It's not, it's not like they are trying to. That's what will come out of it. When you don't allow the Bible to be explained, religion will creep in. You just look at the Bible as a book of rules to keep. Then you have created your own religion in a separate religion, but you're calling it Christianity. Because you have picked verses out of their context and you are practicing it, which is not what the Bible intended. If you are hearing, shout I hear. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, so now, it's for doctrine, teaching, then the word is, next word, is for reproof. Now, if you see that word reproof, it may make you feel that it's to say, if you try it again, I'll beat you. That's what, No. The Bible is not an English material. So, you can use dictionary to explain the Bible. The Bible has its own communication style. So, the Bible will interpret itself. The Bible, there is a sensibility around the Bible. So, when you see that word reproof, it doesn't mean English reproof. That word reproof is Hebrews 11 reproof. What's Hebrews 11 reproof? Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That word reproof is the word evidence. That's why somebody will say, but what is all this now, Pastor? Why can't we just read it like that? Well, you have God gave you good brain, so you can the deeper, right? So that's why you have to go to the original Greek. They always ask, why do we go to the original Greek or Hebrew of the Bible? This English, we are still, we are still working on it. So, so now we're going to Greek. Let's finish English first. Well, unfortunately, not unfortunately, the Bible was not written originally in Greek or Hebrew, or I mean in English. It was written in Greek. So for and when the people were translating it to English, the English language was young. Remember, when you are writing, you are communicating a thought. So the author was communicating a thought in his own language in Greek. Now, somebody came, just like if I have an interpreter that wants to interpret in Yoruba, or I'm preaching in Yoruba, the person wants to interpret in English. There's the Yoruba that, I don't have those skills, but there's the Yoruba that can come out of me. The interpreter will be, will be shook. <laughs> or there's even the English that can come out of me that the Yoruba interpreter will be finding it hard to interpret. So when they were communicating the original thought in Greek, English language was young, so they, that's why you see KJV, thou art, thou, if it was now, I would not say thou art, you get it. So that's why sometimes you go to the original, and somebody say, does this thing have any benefit? Well, it has many benefits, because some of the things you have carried on your head like this, that is causing body in your life, is because of wrong interpretation of the scriptures. 
is causing everybody, for example, tight. Now, giving to God is important. But somebody looks at Malachi 3 and says that you have robbed God. You. Which, which gone? Who can rob God, really? So obviously, that is not literal. That's one. Then he says that by your tithes and your offerings, bring your tithes to the storehouse that there may be food in my house and see if I will not open the windows of heaven and I will rebuke the devourer for sake. First of all, who is he communicating to? So that is what we call in Bible interpretation exegesis. Every verse of the scripture must be within its context. The life of a verse is within the context the verse is used. That is why, for example, the word world, like we always say, is world, right? World is world. The Bible says, love not the world, not the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Friendship with the world is an enmity with God. Then God now says, for God so loved the world. So which one do we do? God, you have now confused us, in quotes. But it's in your Bible now. You know, these things are there. They are in your Bible. It's not me saying it's there. So now, what do I do with world? With the world? <laughs> so, I have to interpret the scriptures rightly. So when he's talking about world, he's talking about the mindset of the world. When he's talking about that being away from the world, that separate yourself from the world. When he's not talking about loving the world, he's talking about the people. Are you with me? I mentioned another thing, like flesh. If you see the word flesh, you know, normally you say fast to punish your flesh. Well, yes. But it's not to punish your eyes, shoulders, knees, and toes. Don't punish that one. You need it. You will grow old and you need your flesh to keep your spirit intact so you can do the work of the Lord on the earth. So don't punish your flesh with fasting that is injuring your stomach or intestine. Because God is not seeing intestine fast. So when the Bible is talking about flesh, put it up, Romans 8, 4, 1, 5, 5. When it's talking about flesh, it's talking about a nature. The nature of man before becoming born again. And the thought that nature produces. Are you with me? Oh, please, please, please. Okay. So the, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh. Are you not walking with your legs? Where well, you are walking, so... What is it? Not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Verse 5. For they that are after the flesh do mind, 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 mind. So when you are fasting, you should be fasting from your wrong thoughts. Not fasting to provoke God. Are you with me? Because if you fast and you do things that are bad to your flesh. God is not the one behind it. All. And he will be looking at you like this as you are doing it. When you finish, he will say, I am not the one that sent you. So that's wrong interpretation of the scripture. So, so the first thing there is to fast from wrong talk. So what he's talking about flesh, he's talking about the old man and the kind of thinking patterns the old man produced. So when you are fasting, for example... A pastor wrote that one, and I think it's very important. I shared it on our WhatsApp church group. That you want to do 150 days, 120 days. Calm down. Let's calculate this thing properly. First of all, how many days are in the year? Then there are some health implications to all these things. And moreover, what you want to do is to create a lifestyle. 
Not that you just do your body some strong things that they have not seen before. Your body too will say, what's happening to me? And the whole idea is that God doesn't see porridge or no porridge that you don't eat. God doesn't see that thing. All God is interested is that as you are fasting, you are aligning your thoughts to his thoughts. Your belief systems are shifting. That's what matters. It's not that, like the one man said, it's not that you are fasting, you are just waiting to, for six o'clock, and you play Nollywood movie, part one, part two, part three. <laughs> just to arrive, then God will say, yes, my son, you've made it to the finish line. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. So that is why someone like a mentor, of, uh, like Gregory Dicker, every January, he starts something called fast from wrong thinking. Start that. See how your life will change. Start fast from that belief that you have generational cause. Fast from it. When you fast from it, you will see how blessings will come. Fast from that belief that you have low self-esteem, that you you can't do well in life. Fast from it, then a cutter, then feast on the goodness of the Lord. Then see how your year will turn out. So when he says, don't mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. So people would say, flesh, 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 lust of the eyes. Well, let's see what the Bible is saying. Verse 6, verse 6, verse 6. For to be carnally still bringing mind is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now, verse 7. Now, it tells you something. Because the carnal mind is against enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Next verse. So they, so then they, that are in the flesh cannot please God. So you now just say, I cannot please God. Well, wait for the next verse. Because the Bible is con- must be interpreted contextually. So what is the next verse? But you are not in the flesh. So the flesh is a nature before you became born again. So somebody say, I'm in the flesh, I cannot please God. No, you are pleasing God every time because you are in the spirit. That's your new status. So flesh is the old nature. Go back to 2 Timothy 3.15. So when he says reproof there, he talks about evidence. So when the Bible is properly taught, which is doctrine, you will arrive at what we call evidence or persuasion. Are you with me? So if I teach you something properly and bring it one step after the other, you will see the evidence of what this thing has, is talking about, and that will now persuade you or change your mind. Are you there? So that's what we prove. Then the, the other word is for correction. It means to reset your mind, to unlearn. So when I explain the Bible properly, you see evidence. You begin to unlearn. If you are humbly receiving the word. You begin to unlearn and relearn. Then the next one is for instruction in righteousness. It's the word pedia, spiritual growth. That's when spiritual growth starts to happen. So until the Bible is explained, you receive evidence and persuasion, then you begin to correct your mindset. That is when you now arrive at spiritual growth. Then what happens after you arrive at spiritual growth? Next verse. The man of God may be perfect. That's mature. You are now prepared to make impact. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So, we must realize that proper interpretation of the Bible is critical to arrive at truth that helps you live in liberty. Now, we are mentioning here that Paul told Timothy that it's supposed to make you wise in subject matter, in the subject matter of salvation, true faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Well, let me share here that the Old Testament has an agenda. John 5, 
35, KJV. John 5, 35. John 5, 35. He was a burning light, and you were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. Next verse. But I have a greater witness. He was talking about John the Baptist. I have a greater witness than that of John. For the works which the Father had given me to finish, the same work that I do bear witness of me than the Father had sent me. So in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, let me put it here, that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are not New Testament books, even though they are New Testament in your Bible. Why? Because Jesus was born of a woman made under the law to redeem them that were under the law. So when Jesus was born, he was still under the law. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is grace in the midst of law. Are you understanding? For a testament to be in effect, there must be of necessity the death of the testator. For a testament is only in effect after men are dead. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is still grace in a law environment. Did you notice that? Because Jesus wants to heal, they say Sabbath day. Grace. Jesus wants to forgive, they say stone. Grace in a law environment. And that is why you must be careful when you are interpreting Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Because many times Jesus is trying to get them to, be, to come to the end of themselves in some of his parables and his teachings so they can believe in him. Because he came to his own and his own received him not. So they were rejecting him. But he was saying, I'm the one you need. So that's why he says, accept your righteousness, exceed that of the Pharisees. And he now said, if your arm causes you to sin, cut it off. And I wonder why the law people run from that. He's trying to get them to the end of themselves. That's why Bible interpretation is important. Because if you go and carry that one out and cut your arm, that's not the intent of Christ in that verse to make you come to the end. The intent is that he wants you to come to the end of yourself, that your righteousness cannot get you into the kingdom. And if your righteousness can get you, then try to cut your arm. So in this verse, he's trying to tell you now that the, that's why in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the works of Jesus speak louder than his words. Why? Because Jesus himself told you, I have many things to tell you, but I can't tell you now. When the spirit of truth will come, he will unveil everything. So that means Jesus tells, tell, is telling you that he didn't say the full, give you the full disclosure. Until after the death, burial, and resurrection, we will not have the full disclosure. Are you hearing? You know, all these things are important in proper Bible interpretation. So that's why he's saying, my works bear witness of me. But the works of Jesus are clear. The works of Jesus reveal the character of God. Who went about doing good to good people. Doing good. So the goodness of God... Or the character of God is revealed in the works of Jesus, which climax at his death, burial, and resurrection. And we see the greatest of all, even on the cross. This day you will be with me in paradise. No fasting, no tight pain. Already with him in paradise, the goodness of the Lord. Now, next verse. Next verse, next verse. And the Father himself, which had sent me, had borne witness of me, now, Jesus is making his red. Jesus is the one right here. He's white here, but he's red in your Bible. Mm -hmm. And the Father himself, which has sent me, had borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time. Any time in Greek is any time. So, any time from Genesis to where they are now, they have never heard the voice or seen God. How can you say that? <laughs> to the papas and the mamas of, our time, of their time, the Pharisees, which were the ones that received the oracles of the law, they were custodians of the law. 
They were the spiritual papas of the law. You are not telling them that, are you saying Moses? Moses. <laughs> you don't know Moses. So. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus, you are learning work here. <laughs> Moses. When Moses did miracle here, serpents were swallowed up. When Moses, was, when Moses came from the mountain, his face was shining. Kata, we had to retreat for Moses. But God is saying, even Moses did not see God. What? Acts 7, verse 35. Let the New Te- so, the New Testament is the revelation of the mysteries of the Old Testament. The New Testament is the revelation of the mysteries of the Old Testament. The Old Testament is Christ concealed. The New Testament is Christ revealed. So when a scripture in the Old Testament is confusing you, hold on. Look at the New Testament to explain the confusions of the Old Testament. And we'll do some of that today as the Lord helps us. Now, this Moses... Look at Moses. But they are saying Moses, even Moses said, God appeared to him in the bush. The Lord appeared to him in the bush. Now, you really need to understand the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, one of, they had limited revelation. 1 Peter 1.18. Remember, Acts 7.35. But let's look at 1 Peter. If you don't like Bible reading, you like it, so... For as much as you know that you were not redeemed from the corruptible things of the world, first, let's look at 17, 16, first, 16. Because it is written, be holy as I am holy. Move to the next verse. For, and if you call on the Father who, without respect of persons, judged according to every man's past the time of sojourn. Yes, next, next verse, next verse. I'm looking for something. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed, with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain of conversation received by tradition from your father. That's the next verse. But with the precious blood of Christ as of the lamp without blemish and without spot. Next verse. Who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. So that means Christ in you is before the law. Which we now say that the New Testament is older than the Old Testament. Because the New Testament was the original intent from the beginning. You see, the whole essence for Christianity is that God wants to live inside man. It's not rules and regulation. Are you getting it? Christianity is not about living for God. It's about living from God. There's a difference. We have now made turned it that is living for God, we said. You keep on doing all this. What you just end up being is a professional, like I say, hypocrite. You will be a skilled hypocrite because the law will only make your heart harsher, harsh heart, like the Pharisees. That's why the Bible says, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that will come unto you. Of which salvation Remember, as from a child, you have known the Holy Scriptures, the Old Testament, which is able to make you wise unto this salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. The prophets inquired about this same salvation. So even the prophets, they had a limited revelation. So 
That is why we now say the Old Testament is Christ concealed. The New Testament is Christ revealed. The Old Testament is types and shadows. The New Testament is the revelation of the types and shadows of the Old Testament. That is why, because the prophets were still inquiring, they couldn't understand the fullness of this thing. Because remember, the Bible just said it, Jesus said it, no man had seen God at any time. So they were still inquiring, what is this Jesus thing? Moses will not understand, he will say, brazen serpent. In Genesis, they'll say the seed of the woman. Does the woman have a seed? It's the man that produces the seed. So that means it was not talking about just seed as in seed. It was talking about that Mary will carry a baby by a divine supernatural means. Because she can produce a seed. It's men that produce seed. So it's a prophecy. Are you hearing? So they couldn't see the fullness of this thing, but they were prophesying the grace that should come in types, shadows, portions of truth. And it takes a careful interpretation of the Old Testament to see that. That is why, because of the limitation of the prophets and the fathers of old in the Old Testament, they didn't see God properly. So what the devil did, they said is God, excuse me, what men did and the consequences thereof, what angels did, because they didn't even know God properly. You see it in Job. I've heard of thee by the hearing of the ear. Are you still with me? So Jesus just made a very um, profound statement that no man had seen God at any time. At any time. So who did Moses see in the burning bush? Acts 7, 35. Who answered the prayer of Elijah? We'll find out. This Moses, whom they refused, saying, who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same did God send to be a ruler and deliver by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. Not God. Verse 38. Verse 38. Verse 38. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel again which spake to him in the Mount Sinai. So God didn't appear to Moses in the bush. God didn't appear to to Moses in Mount Sinai. Because no man had seen God at any time. Oh, Sapana. Let John 1, 17, put it up. The thing is now... John, put it up, put it up. John 1, for the law was given by Moses. I'm not in that matter. My intent was never law. The intent of God has always been Christ in a man. Even in Genesis 1. Genesis 1.1 is a declaration of the intent of God towards man. We'll get there. Okay, let's move a little bit. For the law was given by Moses, but grace, which is the truth, exist in the person of Jesus. Grace is not grace and truth. Grace, is, grace and truth are not different. Grace is the truth. The truth about God's character is grace. That's what he's saying here. You see that word, but? Moses is not grace. That's why I put but. For the law was given by Moses, but that's not my intent. Grace which is the truth about God, exists in the person of Jesus. He didn't hear. Next verse, next verse, next verse. See what he says. No man again had seen God at any time. This is not the same one I just read. It was John 5 I read. Now it's a different verse. He's saying it again. The law of double mention. No man had seen God at any time. The ekatala dona. The only begotten son which is in the bosom, the chest of the father, he had declared him. 
So Jesus is the sole and exclusive revelation of God's character. Now, put Hebrews chapter 1. Put it up, KJV. Hebrews chapter 1. Push it fast. Hebrews chapter 1. I need to move. God, who at sundry times, there was no God there initially. It was at sundry times, that God in the original was not there. Go and check. Who, at sundry times, and in diverse manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. It's the way it says is at sundry times the prophets spoke to the fathers. Now, listen to this. Had in these last days spoken unto us by, that word by, take it out, it's not in the original. To say by, it means that God's, is Jesus, is God's errand boy or God's, you know. So, Jesus, God sent Jesus as one of his guys. In the last day, spoken unto us in his son, in son. So, Jesus, therefore, is God explaining God. Jesus is the sole disclosure of God's character. Jesus is the intent, the architect, the idea, the logic of God operating on the earth. Without controversy, great is the mystery of the Godhead, that God is manifest, not born. So Jesus is God manifest. That's why in Colossians 1.15, they call Jesus the image of the invisible God. That means only Jesus gives visibility to God. God dwells in the immortality that which no man has seen and can ever approach. But Jesus comes to give us the visibility of God. So Jesus is the God you will ever see. So he says, whom he has appointed for all, all things, and also he made the world. So, Jesus, therefore, now in Hebrews 1, he said that in time past, the prophet spoke to the fathers. In these last days, the prophets are not speaking. It's God speaking in his son or in son. Another word is God has spoken. It's not that he's speaking. God is not really speaking again. I'll explain. If you are waiting for a prophet to tell you whether you are blessed, you don't understand the scriptures. God has already spoken. What has he spoken? You have been blessed with all spiritual blessings. So the highest voice of God is in the finished work of Christ. There's you don't need to tell me, I don't need to hear from a prophet whether my business will do well. It did well when Jesus went to the cross for me, approved of me, sanctified me, justified me, and glorified me. So that's why I say God has spoken in song. So that is why even anybody, any prophet tells you anything, it has to be an, an, in alignment to the written word. Now, remember, so God spoke in his son. That is why, so Hebrews actually is a book of retirement. Meaning, what Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews has done now, he has retired the prophets and showed us Jesus. We can learn more. In Hebrews 2, he retires angels and shows us Christ. Because the law is the worship of angels. Let's take it further. Can we take it further? So from the beginning, Luke 24, verse 24, we'll soon close for the first one. Luke 24, verse 24 says, O fools and slow of heart. 25, 25, there were two men that were 
the sepulchre of Jesus, they were with Jesus, but they didn't know they were with Jesus. So Jesus begins to explain himself to them. Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. What did all the prophets speak? All that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ, the, so the prophets spoke of Christ. Major prophets, minor prophets, Obadiah, Hosea, Isaiah, all the ayahs, they were speaking of Christ. That's the agenda. That's the intent. Now, it says, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory, beginning at Moses. Moses is the beginning, the first five books of the Bible. He started with the first five books of the Bible, beginning at Moses and all the prophets. He expounded to them in all the Old Testament the things concerning demonology. The things concerning himself. John 5, 39. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. But they are they that testify of me. So the scriptures don't give eternal life. That means John 3, 16 is not what gives eternal life. It's not about quoting it. It's to see Jesus in the pages of the scriptures. You didn't hear what I said. So eternal life is not a place. Eternal life is a person. So you can't keep laws to arrive at eternal life. You believe in the finished work of Christ. Eternal life sits inside you forever. Okay, now, so John 1.45 says, we have found him. We have found him. So the Bible is about a him. The Bible is not about rules. We have found him, John 1. Philip found Nathanael and said unto him, We are a katanano satire. From the beginning, it has always been a him. It has always been about a him. That a him will come, die, take your place in death, take your place in your, he will be wounded for your transgression, and you will take his place in life. The original intent, the plan, the goal, the intent of God was that he wants to dwell in man from the beginning. That's why when in Genesis 1, when he says, um, in the beginning there, there, there was no, the the earth was void and darkness was on the face of the deep. And God said, let there be light. That was a declaration of intent concerning Christ in the dark hearts of men. Okay, let's take it further before you go there. He said, Philip found in the sign and said, we have found him whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. The writings of the prophets have an intent. is to reveal Jesus of Nazareth. Remember, as from a child, thou hast known the holy scriptures, is able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith in Christ. So the Old Testament is to reveal Christ. John 5, 45. John 5, 45. KJV, John 5, 45. John 5, John 5 now, 45. Not 4, 45. 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45. Ah, uh, 45. John 5, 45. John 5, 45. For I will not, do not think that I will accuse you before the Father. There is one that accuses you, even Moses, whom ye trust. It's there. Next verse. For had you really believed in Moses that you are trusting, you would have known that Moses wasn't writing for himself. When he was saying from Genesis 1, he was speaking of something that will happen. When he said the seed of the woman will bruise the head of the serpent, he was speaking about something that will happen. So in Genesis, is Jesus is the seed of the woman that will bruise the head of the serpent. In Exodus, is the pillar of cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night. In Numbers, is the brazen serpent. So as they put the serpent on a pole, and they looked on Jesus, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. In Joshua, is the one that leads us into victory. In George, 
is the righteous judge and he doesn't judge us. He judges sin on himself. When Jesus wants, God wants to judge sin, he places sin on himself. Deuteronomy is a prophet like unto Moses. So if you see the Old Testament, it's all types and shadows. Moses is born without a shelter and put in a basket. Jesus is born without a shelter and put in a manger. Pharaoh commanded that every Hebrew child below the age of two years old should be killed in Moses' time. In the time of Jesus, Herod also gave a command. It's a prophetic pointer. That the essence of the scriptures is to show you the grace of God, which is Christ. So the Bible is not a book of rules to keep. The Bible is about the grace of God appearing to men. The by Christianity, therefore, is not man reaching out to God. Christianity is God reaching out to man. Christianity, therefore, is not man trying to please God. Christianity is that God has forgiven you all your sins as far as the east is from the west, so as he separated your sins from you. Christianity is that a bruised reed he will not break and a smoking flax he will not quench. That means Christianity is what Isaiah saw a glimpse of. Who shall believe this report? This report is too good to be true. This report is what we should preach every Sunday. Who shall believe this kind of report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? The arm of the Lord is revealed in the good report of Christ. What's the report of Christ? Who's Isaiah 53? Who shall believe this good report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? He's despised Jesus and rejected the man. A man of grief and acquainted with sorrow. And as it were, we hid our faces from him. But he was bruised for our iniquities. He was wounded for our transgression. That's the report. He was bruised for our iniquities. He was wounded for our... The chastisement of our peace was upon him. That's the gospel that brings power to your life. That's the gospel that makes the cripples walk. That's the gospel that opens up the blind eyes. That's what the preaching crusades. They see the power of God. That's what will bring joy back in your life. Because David said, Restore to me the joy of thy salvation. David was even wise that salvation cannot be lost. He said, Restore the joy. He didn't say, Restore the salvation. But there is joy in salvation because the gifts and the calling of God, they are without repentance. Nobody can say, I took your gift away from you. Is salvation not a gift? The Bible says that you are saved by grace through faith, not of works. It is a gift. And Jesus said, The gift and the calling of the Lord is without repentance. That's the gospel that will change lives. That's what people need to hear. That's what people need to meditate on. As they are hearing it, confidence is rising up again. As they are hearing it, they shake off mediocrity. As they are hearing it, they shake off that sickness in them. As they are hearing he bore our sins on his own body on the tree. That us being dead to sin should live again to righteousness. By whose stripes we were healed. Paul was telling you, I'm not ashamed of this gospel. It's the power of God. It's the power of God. It's the power of God. It's the power of God in your life. 